Tech Time Traveler here, and today I have something uh, I'm actually quite excited about. Don't know if you're going to be as excited, because <laughs> it's kind of a one of those things you only appreciate if, uh, you know, you just have a particular interest in something. Um, what I have here is a collection of artwork, including original taped artwork, uh, from a gentleman named Tom. Tom was part of the uh, Association of Computer Experimenters uh, in the late 70s and early 80s uh, in Ontario, Canada. And I actually featured his TV typewriter on my uh, Southwest Technical Products uh, CT1024 video, which if you haven't seen it, uh, obviously I encourage you to check that out. And um, yeah, he actually built his own um, using the plans that were available in the magazine. And uh, some of the uh, resist patterns, I guess that's the term for them, uh, that he created in the service of making his own boards were part of this collection. Now, the Association of Computer Experimenters has specific interest in anything to do with the RCA 1802 microprocessor. And specifically, at one time, they were producing expansion boards for the Neutronix ELF-2, which, as they developed it, eventually became a computer in its own right uh, called the ACE. And Tom was instrumental in helping create some of those boards basically from scratch. Um, I don't know if he did all of them or just some of them, but uh, he basically created them uh, the way that they were created back in the 1970s uh, using 4X tape and uh, decals and stuff like that and arranging it. And basically Tom, unlike a lot of people creating artwork back in the 70s, kept his originals and uh, they've survived all the way to today, which span of about 40 years. So I'm really grateful because now I have them and can show them to others who might be curious about you know, what original PCB artwork looked like in the days before we had uh, CAD design to assist us. And he basically uh, let people know via Cosmac Elf Group that I'm part of that uh, he was looking to part with them. You know, it's, he's just sort of cleaning out his attic, I guess. So uh, I immediately jumped on that because having created my own TV typewriter from the original plans in uh, the radio electronics guide here. Um, I really wanted to understand how things were done back in the day. And, you know, when I was kind of querying uh, older hands uh, on VC Fed about how all that was done, you know, they explained it to me. They were like, oh, yeah, we have 4X tape, red, blue, vellum, etc. And just, you know, lay it all out. And I kind of got it, but I wanted to see a real example. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff was never kept because, you know, once you'd made your circuit boards or once you had your resist pattern, you didn't really need the original uh, artwork anymore. So luckily, Tom kept his in a file uh, for, you know, over 40 years. And uh, now I have a real example of actual hand laid out artwork and uh, resist patterns and stuff uh, that I can keep and hopefully pass on uh, to whoever else might be interested someday. Now, today, when we create circuit boards, we can usually use like a CAD design software like KitCAD. Is it KitCAD or KiCAD? I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, you know, where we can design it from scratch and then either print it out or send the plans to a board house and then they do the etching for us. Or we can use the toner transfer method, which is basically uh, taking already produced artwork and then printing it out on a laser printer and then ironing it onto the copper uh, directly and then using the uh, the toner itself as the resist against your, your etchant. And, and that's actually exactly what I did. When I went to make my replica Don Lancaster's TV typewriter prototype, uh, there were no boards available, obviously, because it's been 40 plus years. Uh, so I had to rely on a plan. So I got a book like this one from Radio Electronics and I went right to the original plans. And basically I just took those and scanned them in using a high quality scanner as line art and then cleaned them up a little bit, made sure the scale was right, printed them off onto magazine paper. And then I did them in a mirror image. I flipped them basically because obviously if you put it down like this, the pattern is gonna come out the reverse of what you're looking for. Uh, and then I printed that onto magazine paper using a standard HP laser printer that I had. And then I just did a nice iron on, you know, really pressed it on. And that's probably the worst part of the whole process is trying to 
get all the toner onto the board. It's a nightmare. <laughs> like I literally, I, I developed a process in the end that was pretty much 99% reliable. But uh, yeah, you, like you really got to press on it to get the toner to let go of the magazine and adhere to the copper. And there's always some little trace somewhere that just doesn't want to transfer for whatever reason and you only find out after you lift it up. But uh, yeah, so that's that was kind of a nightmarish process. And that was the, the worst and the hardest part of the whole deal. And then once the uh, toner was firmly fixed to the copper, and uh, I was sure that all of it was there, or as, as much of it as I could get, uh, then I would take that and I created a etchant solution of uh, household cleaning vinegar, salt, and uh, peroxide. And basically put that in a tub, let it etch. It's a milder solution than some of the other stuff that's out there. Some of the other stuff is really nasty and comes with environmental issues for disposal. So yeah, I that's basically how I did it. So you can only imagine what it would have been like back in the 70s when you didn't have computers to assist you. If you were doing your own circuit board design from scratch, you had to lay this stuff out with tape and you know some decals and stuff. And you had to spend like hours, like hours and hours doing it because uh, you know it's just a very finicky process. Um, it requires a lot of time, a lot of manual dexterity. And of course you've got to make sure you don't make any mistakes or your circuit board's not gonna work. So yeah, there, there was a lot of uh, effort that went into it back in the day. An example of how the whole PCB creation process could go sideways was the uh, prototype for the SOL, uh, which is a computer that was created by uh, processor technology, uh, mostly designed, I believe, by Leif Elsenstein. And um, you know they used a, a fairly similar process uh, to what Tom would have used in terms of creating the original artwork. There's a story published online uh, attributed to Lee where he talks about, you know, they had this big light table set up to, to shine light up through a transparency, I think. And then they had their tape, I think it was 4X tape, red and blue. And him and another guy were working round the clock to get it all taped out. And uh, when they produced the actual boards, the first run of them, uh, there were actually a whole bunch of glitches. And the actual prototype, which became the feature article for that month's popular electronics issue, uh, required something like 100 jumper wires to correct all the mistakes in the board and actually make the thing work. And that's one of the reasons why the board they went with for the SAL 20 is so different uh, from the prototype board because uh, they, they just need to, to overhaul the whole thing uh, to get it right. Okay, so without further ado, Let's uh, have a look at what we've got here. I love these uh, paper folders that Tom made out of graph paper. Very uh, ingenious. Let's see what we've got here. I'll just use a piece of paper, white paper here to make it show up a little better. So this is a negative resist pattern for a board that I think is for the TV Typewriter 2 project, which is Tom's actual unit that I have in my collection. So yeah, this would have been taken from the magazine article or one of the magazine articles that accompanied it and then basically photographed, uh, scaled up to the right size and then reversed uh, so that I guess whatever resist uh, he was using um, would be effective. And again, I'm open to correction on all of this because again, I wasn't there and I never had the chance to, to do this process. But I believe with the, what I'm calling the negative resist method and I might have that backwards it might be positive I'm not sure I'm pretty sure this is pretty sure this would be considered negative um, so basically what you're doing is you're taking a blank piece of uh, PCB stock like this call it copper clad um, and probably for something like this you would cut it down to size and then you would cover it with your resist chemical which is what's going to stop the uh, etchant from eating away the metal where you don't want it to and then you would take this pattern, put it over your, your board basically and expose it. I think it would typically be UV light. And then the UV light exposure would basically harden the resist uh, compound uh, in the areas where you don't want the etchant eating away the copper. And then you would take this away and you would basically dunk your board in your etchant and basically it would eat away everything except for the parts that were hardened. I don't know if you would have had to like rub off uh, the remaining etchant that wasn't exposed to the UV or if you just threw it in the tank and it uh, got eaten away because it hadn't reacted. But 
Yeah, I, I believe that's how that process works. And again, I'm up for a correction on that. Like I said, I wasn't there, um, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. And yeah, and you can see we've got these little targets here and that's to align this because this is a two-sided board. And this was another thing that was an absolute nightmare. If you were trying to create a two-sided PCB, you had to be like bang on with your measurements and everything and making sure that it all lined up. I'm told there was quite a bit of wastage creating two-sided boards uh, way back when just because it was so hard to, to get things aligned correctly and get it to etch correctly on both sides. Just carefully, oh, got a couple in there. Okay, what do we got here? Ah, okay, so this is the memory board. So this is definitely for the TV typewriter two that I have that Tom built. This is uh, the memory board for it. You can see there's the six uh, memory chips there. And this is the top side. And then this would be the bottom side, I guess. Yeah, now I don't know how he was aligning here. I guess maybe, maybe he was using, oh, I see. So maybe he was using these uh, corners here to line it up instead of the targets. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I just, I, yeah, I would have just said, no, nope. I'll just buy the, the kit board somewhere. Thank you very much. Don't need that hassle in my life. Okay, VDU negs and artwork. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be related to the Ace because um, the TV Typewriter 2 did not have a, a VDU per se. Not, not an actual separate board. Okay, so this is a resist pattern. Again, BDU A. Yeah, I don't see any actual ICs on there, so I'm not really sure. So this, I think if I, if I understand correctly, this was published in Ipso Facto or in some magazines as an add-on project uh, for the uh, Neutronics ELF 2, of course, because the A started out as a, uh, a series of add-ons for that computer. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. Aha. So this looks like basically a positive resist pattern and I don't know if this is a design of Tom's or if this is something that he copied out of the magazine. It says VDU C which I would think is, relates to the Ace. I'd really have to look this up. But this would be kind of akin to the modern toner transfer process that we use where basically you take your board and you put your uh, resist solution on there which is a, a different type of resist than uh, what I mentioned previously and then you put this pattern over it, you expose it to UV light, but instead of hardening the resist, the UV light uh, actually breaks this type of resist down, leaving only the resist that is covered by the pattern. And then basically you throw it in your etchant and away you go. So that's really cool. There's another one that fell out. This is VDUB, again, same idea. What do we got under here? Okay, and these are reverse images of VDUC. Uh, again, I don't really know what the context is here or what this board belongs to, but I'm assuming it's to do with the, the ACE or the add-ons for the Neutronics Elf. Yeah, and these are stuck together. I don't know if they fold over or something. Yeah, it kind of looks, no. no. These are two different things. I'll have to ask Tom what the deal is. Okay, now this we should recognize. So this is the VDU-A. Remember when we saw this earlier? Yeah, I thought I saw this earlier. Okay, so this is the resist pattern that this uh, was created to create. So basically you can see this is, 
Yeah, I mean, it seems to be literally about four times the size of the ultimate resist pattern. And if we look at it very carefully, we can see that this is actually tape on here. It's kind of peeling off in places, so I got to be careful. But um, yeah, so basically these are just little pieces of tape that have been bent and cut and placed in position for the, the pattern that Tom wanted. Um, and then usually these, it's kind of hard to see. I'll hold it right up to the camera. These are basically decals. So you would basically have a, a sheet of these, sort of like this. This is a, a sheet of decals from uh, Radio Shack. Now these obviously are all ready to scale. Um, again, the reason you would typically do something like this, blowing it up to four times the size, is just it's just easier to work with. If the design wasn't too complex, you could do it in kind of a one-to-one, -one, but when you started getting into, you know, a bunch of traces close together or whatever, um, I mean, yeah, you potentially could have done it at uh, the proper scale here. I mean, these don't look like they're too close together, but it probably would have been a bit of a challenge. But yeah, that is a 4X taped uh, piece of artwork there. And uh, yeah, that's it's pretty amazing to see the process and sort of how it happens. Uh, what's interesting on this one is it was done on clear um, plastic rather than uh, vellum, which is interesting. I can see where the trace tape broke off there. That's where that one is. Okay, let's see what else we got here. I just find this stuff fascinating. I, I know it's kind of a, a geeky thing, but to see, uh, you know, it's one thing to hear the process described, but to actually see it in person is something entirely different. Okay, now this is vellum. Yeah, there we go. And again, this is probably at four times the scale. You can see this is tape. You can actually feel the ridges of it um, if you touch it. Uh, I don't want to touch it too much, though. I don't want to destroy it. Uh, and these are decals. Um, yeah, it looks like I'll try to pull it up to the light there. Maybe that'll expose. But yeah, basically, you would just cut them off from your, uh, your decal sheet. Obviously, a sheet that's scaled bigger than these cut them off and then uh, stick them in place uh, or sometimes iron them on, I think, is the other way. But yeah, I mean, just imagine sitting there in, when was this? December 1976. So yeah, that was a long damn time ago. I mean, that's, that's almost as old as I am. Um, you can see he's put the targets there uh, to basically align it because it's probably a two-sided board. Wow. And this would have appeared, you know, somewhere in a magazine or something. This this is where it started. He was just literally sitting there just cutting off pieces of tape, putting them together, probably cursing and swearing every once in a while when uh, something didn't align up the way that it needed to or whatever. I mean, look at these crazy bends. <laughs> just like, oops, I got to turn here and then turn around there and go up there. Yeah, this is how you can tell something's handmade versus uh, machine made. Let's see what else we got here. This is another one. Uh, now I've read, and I'm hoping I've read it right, that often these were laid out with colored tape, like red, like literally red and blue. Um, I have yet to see one of those, but I've I've heard of it. Um, but this this looks to be all in black. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I kind of had an idea to to take these. I'm just going to very carefully put those over there because I don't know where they came from. Um, to take these and basically uh, try and make some new boards out of them because I, I really would love to, to have an ace. You just can't find them for sale because there were probably very, very few made. Uh, this is the a and memory translator. Yeah, again, this would be at uh, four times the size. October 21st, 1976. So you can see... Uh, some of the traces have been lost uh, because it was being stored kind of bent. Man, that's cool. What else we got here? Aha, this is the computer cursor. Okay, so maybe that board wasn't for the TV typewriter. I might be wrong. Um, do I still have that one somewhere? Easily accessible or is it buried? This is the original. This is the 
properly scaled uh, negative resist pattern. Yeah. I don't think he would sit there if this had been published in a magazine already and laid out by hand by yourself unless he was trying to change something. So I don't know, I'll have to ask him about that. I, I assumed it was a TV typewriter 2 board just because I recognize these uh, these would typically be the mounting holes for the Molex connectors, but I could be completely wrong on that. Look at your targets. Look at those. I, I, I'd love to see what the actual, like if the tape came in these widths or if you actually had to cut it all the way along, like that would have been a nightmare. No thanks. Wow, holy smokes, that's a big one. Okay, this is IO. We've got a keyboard. We've got a bunch of mounting points. Yeah, this, this board looks to me like one of the boards in my TV typewriter. And it's a strange board that I have never personally seen before. So... Uh, yeah, I'm thinking maybe these were Tom's own improvements. 1977 would have been about the time that he would have been building that TV typewriter. It's a little bit before he would have been messing around with the ELF stuff, I think. So yeah, there's there's a board that looks just like this one. It's a big wide board that isn't present in my uh, TV typewriter 2 that was made by Southwest. And yeah, this is, uh, this is quite intense. I'm going to have to take a look at that. Man, this must have been hours, just hours laying this out and getting it all aligned properly. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> no thanks. Appreciate uh, the effort that went into it, but no thank you. I would never, have, I, I, my hands would be shaking like this, just trying to get it all done. Uh, this is the bottom. So I think this is that cursor control board again. Yeah, this is a, a cursor board. Wow. And this is the back side of that keyboard board. Oh, yeah, I, I have to talk to Tom and find out exactly what the, the story was. He, he didn't remember a whole lot um, about building it there. I, I remember when I first got it and I was trying to get it up and running. I was pestering him with a lot of questions and he's like, eh, I, don't, I don't know, you know, don't remember specifically what that did or how that worked. But yeah, I mean, as I can attest, the passage of time tends to subvert your memory a lot. Okay, this is, uh, yeah, that's the screen read board. Looks like, I think that's just the standard one from the article. Um, yeah, that's the same. And there is, so this is basically this one. Reduced to size. So that's the actual size of the board and that's how it was laid out. gentle with these. Keep it all organized here, but it's not labeled, so I'm gonna be, I guess it doesn't matter that much as long as they're protected. It's not like they're ever gonna be used again. I wouldn't think. So this is the motherboard for the TV typewriter 2. And again, yeah, this is the, the negative resist pattern for it, or positive, depending, I don't, I don't know. 100% on that, but yeah, if you wanted to, to make one the old way, there you go, and that is the actual size of it. And then this would be the back side. Man. Just seems like it would have been a whole lot easier just buy the kit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, if you had the ability, you had access uh, to the materials and the tools that work, uh, like Tom did, then uh, you can definitely save a few bucks. And then I believe this last one is another hand-laid PCB artwork for the clock. 
which I don't know if that's in the TV typewriter. I'm thinking it is. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, um, yeah, that's kind of all there is to this one. I just wanted to kind of show these off because they're quite old and quite rare. Um, you know, I've, I've heard these processes described a thousand times uh, on various forums, but I've never actually held real original artwork in my hands like I have now. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with these. I've thought about maybe framing them or um, just putting them somewhere because I, I think they're important historical documents. You know, they, they show a process. And uh, it's nice to have the original negatives that were used to actually develop the TV typewriter too that I have in my collection. That's that's really cool because that you know helps create a story about how that was uh, designed and created. But yeah, I just wanted to show this off to people who have you know like me heard of these processes but may have been too young to ever see it uh, uh, in process. And uh, yeah, we will see you in the next video, which. Uh, I've got a few in the pipeline. It's probably either going to be about my mindset, which uh, is actually just sitting over here, or um, or I've also got a project going about internet appliances. So we'll see which one gets finished first. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you soon.